0-2-7-1. Bakudis versus Dean. Mr. East. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. My name is Kenneth East, and I represent the defendant appellant, former Fort Worth Police Officer Aaron Dean. This is an interlocutory appeal from the district court's denial of qualified immunity at the motion to dismiss stage. The issue is obviously the plaintiff's allegations, whether or not they're sufficient to state a, both to state a claim and to overcome my client's qualified immunity as to both of their causes of action, one for alleged unlawful search, one for alleged excessive force. Your honors know from the briefing that many of the allegations are undisputed. Based on plaintiff's own pleading, this is obviously a terribly sad case. A young woman named Tatiana Jefferson lost her life. But it's also a case in which two things are true at the same time. It's a tragedy on the one hand, factually, but legally, Officer Dean did not violate the United States Constitution by, as plaintiffs themselves allege, simply following his orders and responding to a call the way he was trained and instructed to do so. He and another co-responding officer, who were both rookies, received a call at 2.30 in the morning to respond to what the Fort Worth Police characterized as an open structure call. <clears throat> as plaintiffs themselves allege, Fort Worth officers are trained to treat such calls, presumably because such calls would not come in for unsuspicious or non-suspicious open structures. They're trained to treat such calls as a burglary in progress, a silent alarm call, or an audible alarm call. The same procedures apply to all types of calls. And those procedures include covertly approaching the residents so as not to allow the burglars to escape or ambush the officers to do a perimeter sweep of the property to look for signs of burglary or trouble. Their, their mission is to protect the home and its Before occupants. Perimeter sweep, did he see any such signs? Well, there's a mischaracterization in the district court's order and repeatedly in Appley's brief. They used the phrase, Officer Dean saw no sign of disturbance. That's never pleaded in the complaint. When he approached the residence, he looked into the open front door, which they, they say he did. They do not tell you what he saw therein. It's one of the examples in this case of plaintiffs cleverly pleading by omission. They don't say what he saw in there. Then they say he went to the back of the house, looked at a car and a detached garage, and they say with those two items, he saw no signs of disturbance. The district court and the appellees in their briefing have elevated that to saying he saw no signs of disturbance at all. They didn't allege that. Counsel, and I understand there was uh, body cam footage in the, in, in the case. Is that the correct? The officer did have body camera activated, but if motion to dismiss stage, it's not part of the record. It wasn't offered up to, as a, a uh, assistance? I've done that before. It was not done in this case. Mm -hmm. okay. It's worth noting that defendant filed one motion to dismiss. The district court sua sponte denied it and then ordered plaintiffs to replead with the heightened factual specificity, specificity and particularity required by Shultia v. Wood. <clears throat> Appellees in the district court cite one case, Arnold v. Williams, which they claim says Shultia doesn't heighten the pleading standard, but it doesn't say that at all. All Arnold v. Williams says is it recognizes the Shultia uh, pleading standard and noted that the district court didn't order it in that case. It, the, the district court in this case did order it. But whether you're talking about the heightened pleading of Shaltia or the Iqbal Twombly standards, plaintiffs put forth nothing more than enough factual allegations to allow speculation. They do not state a plausible claim for a constitutional violation. And so there are two violations we're dealing with. One is the unlawful search claim. With regard to that, there are a few things I wanted to point out. Courts have repeatedly treated cases differently if it involves an officer searching for evidence to use against a property owner. If you suspect drugs or weapons are in the house and you're peering through windows or creeping onto the property, that's a search for evidence in a, in a criminal law enforcement capacity that's different than the protective capacity Officer Dean was in in this case. And to, to explain that to the court, 
Um, I cited the Sixth Circuit case of Taylor versus Michigan versus Dep Department of Natural Resources, where there an officer with very little reason to do so goes onto a property, looks through windows because he thinks somebody might have burglarized the property. The court said, under the Fourth Amendment, that's not a search at all because he wasn't looking for evidence to use against the homeowner. He was in a protective mode, and homeowners would want officers to do that. And uh, it's consistent with the continually of a strong... It's not a search or it's a reasonable search? No. The Sixth Circuit said it's not a search at all under the for Fourth Amendment analysis purposes because he wasn't... The, the courts draw a distinction between searching for evidence as a, a law enforcement officer doing, performing a, that type of police function versus a law enforcement officer performing a function designed to protect a home and its occupants. The Sixth Circuit clearly says that in Taylor. And a case that I emailed to counsel last week that's not in my brief, which is just this fifth, this court recognizing the Taylor case, is King versus Handorf, H-A-N-D-O-R-F, 821 F. 3rd, 650. In that case, the court recognized the holding in uh, Taylor and said, if an officer can enter the curtilage, rattle doorknobs, peer inside a home without the consent of the homeowners, and his actions still do not constitute a Fourth Amendment search, then it is likely that Handorf's actions here do not constitute a search either. They went on to grant qualified immunity to the officer in that case. It's consistent with the justices' concurring opinions in the Coniglia case. Uh, justices in that case bent over backwards to say that our holding here doesn't mean that there aren't a whole bunch of things officers do on a daily basis that don't require the level of probable cause and exigent circumstances that are required if you're trying to search for evidence. Justice Alito said, it does not follow that all searches and seizures conducted for non-law enforcement purposes must be analyzed under precisely the same Fourth Amendment rules developed in criminal cases. Those rules may or may not be appropriate for various non-criminal law enforcement contexts. We did not decide that issue today. So either it's not a search at all. Is that a case dealing with the home or the curtilage of the home? Well, so the Coniglia case is complicated, and it was is very uh, sort of a tortured uh, analysis of a uh, a rule that we had for car searches called the community caretaking function. And in that case, the parties said, "We're not asking for anything. We're not talking exigent circumstances. We're not talking about anything else. We're just saying, does the the car." community caretaking function extend to the home. And in that case, there was a home where the officers went in to look for a gun because they thought the guy was dangerous. And the justices said, well, based on the only thing that's before us, we're not going to extend the community caretaking function to homes, but there are a lot of other reasons why uh, this search may have been okay, but we're not asked to decide that. And there are a lot of other instances officers engage in, such as Officer Dean, where it's not a constitutional violation. So th that case is an unusual case, but it supports that there's a difference in Officer Dean was not out there looking for evidence against the Tatiana Jefferson or the homeowner. Um, so either it was not a search at all for Fourth Amendment purposes or if it was, it was a, there was exigent circumstances and I cite the cases Belita and others where officers responding to silent alarm calls, for example, um, courts say that it's kind of like a no-brainer that officers obviously can Respond and Belita, the First Circuit said, the, the exigent circumstances argument preserved. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, yes Your Honor. Um, and uh, in that case, they said the officer is entering to the backyard in response to a silent security alarm is a perfectly good example of a perceived imminent threat, the, the exigent circumstance that would allow him to do that. Um, and overall, on top of all this, there is no clearly established law that Appleys have cited under factual circumstances remotely similar to this case. The cases they cite are the types of cases that are distinguished where an officer is pursuing evidence, is trying to catch a homeowner in a, in a bad act, and their, their cases are not on point. It's not a, there, are, there are no cases remotely similar, and, and a lot of them are, are uh, non-binding press, they're not precedential cases, and they're decided after the facts of this case, so they cannot clearly establish the law. And the last point on the search issue is, there is no question that Officer Dean was following the orders he was given by his department. Plaintiffs plead that in their, in their petition, they, in their complaint. They plead it so that they can have a claim against the city of Fort Worth. And in their Appleby's brief, they say, well, that only matters in deliberate indifference jail cases. And 
they have a footnote that says that, and they say here, in those cases, say that if following orders does not violate following orders does not violate clearly established law unless the orders are facially outrageous. And they say here the orders may not have been facially outrageous. And so in their brief, there was a case decided after I filed my opening brief, and they cited it, but for a different purpose. And that case, I think, appears in their brief and my reply brief. It's Von Der Haar versus Watson. And in that case, the Fifth Circuit applied that rationale to just a run-of-the-mill Fourth Amendment case and said that in a Fourth Amendment case, following orders does not violate clearly established law when the orders are not facially outrageous. And even more significant, the court said, without argument as to why the order was facially outrageous, such that following it was objectively unreasonable, that's an insufficient argument to overcome the officer's qualified immunity. So as always, the court can decide there was no constitutional violation, or even if there was, the officer retains qualified immunity because the law was not clearly established. I don't think there's much question that the law is not clearly established, that Officer Dean and his co-responding officer could not respond to a call and treat it the way they were ordered and trained to treat it under these circumstances. And there's certainly no case that's been cited to this court that says that. The other issue is plaintiffs were ordered to plead with factual particularity in their initial... Four minutes left. Do you want to get to your excessive force? That's what I'm doing right now, Your Honor. Thank you. And in their opening, in their, in their complaint, when I filed my first motion, they didn't say a word about whether or not Tatiana Jefferson had a weapon. When ordered to plead with more specificity, they didn't change a single thing, except they added a sentence that said she didn't point a weapon at Officer Dean. So instead of saying she didn't have a weapon, which they can't say, they, they don't say what she did with her weapon. They just try to avoid it altogether and ask the court to fill in the blanks and speculate that there could be a scenario where face-to-face -face with this armed subject, Officer Dean didn't really feel threatened. And they do so um, with, uh, you know, for one, at one point they talk about this flashlight. And so they have two sort of contradictory paragraphs back-to-back, -back, and that's in, in their live complaint, the record page is 527, and it's their paragraphs 49 and 50. In one paragraph, they say, Miss Jefferson, the Dean's view of Jefferson through the window was obstructed by the reflection of this flashlight. But then in the very next paragraph, number 50, they say, Dean's body camera footage shows Miss Jefferson did not point a weapon at Dean. And so either it was clear enough to see or it wasn't. And all they're telling us is that she showed up to this window suddenly while Dean was in the midst of his perimeter sweep. He sees her instantly pulls out his weapon, shines his flashlight, shouts commands, and fires a single shot in defense. And all we know from their allegations, despite being ordered to plead with specificity, is that she didn't point the weapon at him. But we know from Salazar and Limon and other cases that officers don't have to wait for the uh, a subject to turn with weapon in hand. They don't have to wait for the gun to be pointed at them. If they see anything that perceives they reasonably perceive to be a threat of death or serious bodily injury, they have a right to defend themselves. So, so we really don't have anything in terms of facts at this juncture uh, other than we don't know, for instance, uh, whether she had a weapon or did not, and if she did, whether she was pointing it in a threatening way. We don't know whether your client announced he's with the police department upon seeing a person he didn't say freeze or anything we don't know that um we, we agree on what he said okay but but there are still a number of facts that we don't know in order to consider qualified immunity for just going at rule 12 and that's why i had asked you earlier about the video as to the excessive force claim we're talking about yes yes there are a number of facts we don't know and the reason we don't know them is because plaintiffs intentionally didn't put them in their complaint despite being ordered to do so by the district court. And so they're asking, and, and the law is clear that a, a speculative scenario is not enough. Uh, get some language here. Um, uh, Alleging no more than a sheer possibility of misconduct under Iqbal Twombly is not sufficient to state a claim. Uh, a, spec a agreed facts that raise nothing more than a speculative scenario of potential misconduct is not enough to state a claim. Our Fifth Circuit has ruled many times. And so 
that's what we have here. We have a lawful search or sweep or whatever you want to call it of the perimeter, whether it not be a search under Fourth Amendment purposes or under exigent circumstances or he was following orders. And in the midst of that, he's suddenly confronted, nobody disputes that, by this figure in the window that we can only assume was armed by the allegation that says she didn't point her weapon at him. Otherwise, why not just say one way or the other? And in that instant, he had to make a decision to shoot or be shot. And, and plaintiffs have given us nothing else to go on. And I think under the pleading rules that we have, especially overlaying the Shultia particularity that was required, they haven't met their burden to overcome his qualified immunity. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. You've reserved five minutes. Ms. Rao. Good afternoon. May it please the court. Davey Rao on behalf of Plaintiff Apelli David Bakudis. An innocent woman was shot and killed in her home when she posed no threat by an officer who violated her clearly established Fourth Amendment rights twice. First, by entering her cartilage without a warrant and without exigent circumstances, and then by shooting her dead when he saw her figure in the window. Officer Dean is not entitled to qualified immunity, and this court should affirm. I'll start with You the say pose no threat. And certainly you would be right that if somebody poses no threat, then they shouldn't be shot. But I thought we just had a discussion about a gun. Why don't we talk about that? So, Your Honor, read in taking all the factual allegations as true and read in plaintiff's favor, um, she, Ms. Jefferson was unarmed and in her home when Officer Dean shot her dead. Because I think you can read the uh, fact that she didn't shoot uh, – point a weapon at him to be because she doesn't have a weapon. Um, so opposing counsel is saying that uh, the implication through some of these pleadings uh, is that she was armed. Is your point that that's a summary judgment issue rather than 12B6 issue? That's right. And that's what um, that's similar to the posture in Baker. So in that case, um, which made it all the way to trial, this court denied um, summary judgment and qualified immunity because factual disputes included whether the plaintiff was armed and if so, what he was doing with the weapon when he was shot. And this is true even though the court described um, the situation there as um, chaos at the beach. And so if she, whether she had a weapon and if so, what she was doing with it is a fact that will no doubt be unearthed um, through discovery and will be disputed at summary judgment where Officer Dean would be entitled again to raise the defense of qualified immunity. Um, our position at which the, the district court agreed with, is on the facts as put in the complaint. There are two clearly established constitutional violations here. Um, I'll go to the search claim because um, my friend spent a, a lot of time there. Um, warrantless searches of the home, including the cartilage, are presumptively unconstitutional. And in Lang, the Supreme Court said that contours to the exceptions to the warrant requirement are jealously and carefully drawn in keeping with the centuries-old principle that the home is entitled to spe special protection. And we talked about Coniglia uh, a few moments ago. Coniglia affirms that idea because in that case in 2021, the Supreme Court said there's no community caretaking exception um, when the home is involved. You just go through the normal Fourth Amendment analysis and you ask whether um, in this court, this court's decision in the United States v. Lim, um, whether uh, probable cause and exigent circumstances exist. Um, probable Exigency is the defendant's burden to prove, um, and this court looks to factors that relate to destruction of evidence and danger to others. There is no, um, there is no information that Officer Dean received when he arrived at the scene to suggest that there was any exigency. The radio call he was responsible. The front door was open at 2 a.m.? The, the front door was open at 2 a.m., and the neighbor called it in. It was radioed to him as an open structure call. But this court's case law teaches that when an officer um, arrives on the scene, they need to corroborate or receive additional evidence suggesting an exigency, um, and otherwise the warrant, warrant requirement applies. That's Linicom. What is the best Fifth Circuit or Supreme Court case we can look at on open structure calls? Uh, and you mentioned one earlier. Uh, is there anything that we th that you think is directly controlling in this case on the open structure call? 
Your Honor, the Fifth Circuit doesn't appear to have any guidance on open structure calls, um, but that um, is not dispositive for um, qualified immunity purposes because when we're talking here about the warrant requirement, which is the foundational requirement um, of uh, law enforcement, um, this court has articulated the level of generality this way in Smith v. Lee. Um, Smith's right to not have her home searched without a warrant, consent, or some other legal justification was clearly established. And then they cite to the, the year um, at issue in that case. So the baseline um, understanding of any law enforcement officer, any reasonable law enforcement officer, is the warrant requirement exists for a reason, and you have to have exigent circumstances before you violate the sanctity of the home. Yeah, but the, you know, if you, let's say we're talking about your home or my home. Uh, an officer, uh, a neighbor sees the front door open at 2 a.m. Uh, the officer sees that as well. You, surely we would say that the homeowner would want that to be investigated. And it was investigated, Your Honor. So after um, Dean arrived on the scene, and again, he parked around the corner without putting his lights on so as to not identify himself, he arrived on the scene. Here's, here's what he did. He looked through the open front door. He looked through the screen window at the front door. Then he looked through another screen door, the outside of the property, the car is in the driveway. Are you describing the steps that he's taking as part of the reasonable investigation? Yes, and before... In other words, these are not actions in violation of the Fourth Amendment, or are Correct. They? We're, our search claim only is triggered um, after... So he searched the outside of the property. He looks at the cars in the driveway. Yeah, and all that's okay. All that's fine. Our claim doesn't begin until after he then looks at the garage and the garage door, and then the door on the fence next to the garage. All fine, all part of his investigation. But then what he does is he opens the side, the gate and enters her side yard, and that's curtilage that's clearly established under Sorallo and Seseda. And that's when the search begins. That is the, pro the Fourth Amendment problem. At that point, with no evidence, and I'll quote, um, he didn't observe any indications of a disturbance consistent with a burglary in process. I take it the steps that you're agreeing were okay. He gained no information one way or the other. Well, I... You disagree with that? I'll, I'll push back a little bit. It's actually he gained information suggesting that this is not a burglary in progress. T tell me about that. Why, why is that? Well, so he saw nothing amiss. He saw um, an open... Um, but I'm assuming you tell me about the property. Uh, obviously, you would know better than I. These steps would have confirmed that there was nothing going on as far as he could tell, but there were other parts of the property, I assume, that he had not yet seen. Well, as far as he could tell, but he did gain information. So, for, existence, he, for instance, he saw cars in the driveway. Cars in the driveway suggests that, in fact... People are home, and it's probably the homeowners. There's there's no suggestion that these cars had been tampered with, or that they're you know cars that aren't supposed to be there. So the type of information that courts, and again, not this court because we this court doesn't hasn't addressed it, but that courts that my friend cites to have allowed for exigent circumstances ha are distinguishable. One, they involve actual burglary calls or alarm calls. But then when the officer arrives on scene, they perceive additional evidence corroborating the call and suggestive that there is a crime underway and, and the need to enter the property without a warrant. So in Johnson, there were broken windows. Um, in McCullough, the grungy and nervous people exiting the house, unable to identify the homeowner. In Barasio, there were pry marks on the front door. And all of these facts, combined with a call that is actually a burglary call, was enough to, um, for there to be an exigency. But the, the facts here are very different. And again, at the motion to dismiss phase, we, this is more than enough to reach discovery as to um, the facts uh, that, you what know. I guess I'm not understanding, though, is if you're agreed that the open door uh, at 2 a.m. is enough to establish a plausible inference of a burglary or, or something requiring investigation, why did that go from plausible to implausible based on the limited steps that you've agreed to? 
Uh, I'm, I don't think it's plausible to think an open door necessarily as a burglary. The open door was called in as an open door. Um, and it was certainly, you know, he he came and did some investigations, but that's very different. So that's this is similar to Linicom, which is... But if you're saying, if, if, so if a front door is not enough for a burglary, then why, why are you conceding the first steps? Um, You'd be saying that all of these actions are a violation. I think we could have pled um, potentially um, the search claim a different way where the search started earlier, but that's not the allegations. The allegations, the way it was pled. Your theory is front door at 2 a.m. of a home is open, but what? The police just should let that go? No. I'm not following the... No, I, I was saying um, we're not... We're not saying either way about the earlier steps. We, this court just doesn't need to... Right, I, I was assuming you were conceding that, but then you said, well, you could have pled it more broadly. So that's what I'm trying to understand. I just don't think the court needs to reach that. So the, the front door was open. He could and should have, you know, approached the door and knocked, at which point he would have under, gained all of the information that he needed, which is that nothing was amiss. And this was, in fact, the homeowner who left the door open to get a breeze into the house. Um, but he didn't do that. In Linicum, the, there was a call that went out um, about uh, children who sort of needed medical attention within the home. And when the officers, which is suggestive of an exigent... That is a Fifth Circuit case. Yes. Um, this is this court's precedent from 2018 before the events in question here. Um, suggestive of an exigency. But when the officers arrived, they um, found... They did not observe or receive information suggesting that the call was um, corroborated. And this court said, therefore, the officers did not have um, reason, ex exigent circumstances, based on their um, information they received once they got to the, to the home. Let me just ask one factual question, though. It sounds like what you're saying is the first steps were fine. It's the opening of the gate to the back of the house or to a different part of the house. That's when the violation began. That's right. You're there. Uh, would I be right in assuming that entering uh, this area was exposing a different part of the home that he had not yet seen? That's right. Um, Why isn't it possible that there was a burglary in that part of the house? That's what I'm not getting. Is if it's if it's okay to, to at least be worried about burglary, so should, shouldn't the officer have the right to check the entire house? Why? Why only the front part of the house? The Fourth Amendment doesn't distinguish between parts of the home and the home itself and cartilage. So if Dean is suggesting that um, he had the right, based on the call alone, and um, to just basically enter the cartilage, that's the same thing as saying he had a right to enter the home, just based on an open structure call. And I, I don't think that's consistent with, you know, centuries of Fourth Amendment um, precedent. But just to be clear, he didn't enter the home in this case at all, right? He 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 entered the cartilage, he but, the gate, right, the cartilage. but for Fourth Amendment purposes, they are one and the same. And so basically accepting his proposition that the burglary call was enough to allow him to enter the cartilage, even though he saw he investigated outside the home and saw nothing amiss, would essentially give him the right to just walk through the front door, and despite the fact that... I think you had said earlier that with the front door open at 2 a.m., he should have gone to the front door and knocked. I think that's one reasonable... And that's, that's, that's one possible action. I'm not a police officer. I assume one reason not to is that then alerts people or, or alerts the would-be burglar that somebody's there. Could he have walked into the front door at that moment? Um, You're saying he can knock on the front door. Let's say he knocks and there's no answer. Could he have walked in at that moment? No, no, he could not have done that because the, again, there's nothing on the ground that he is, no information on the ground corroborating anything suspicious going on. There's no broken window. There are no pry marks on a door. There's no evidence that the cars that are in a driveway are not supposed to be there. Exactly. And my friend referenced Justice Kavanaugh's um, concurrence in the Coniglia case where he says basically there's an old man. He goes to church every Sunday. He hasn't been seen for a while. Surely we want officers to be able to go to the home and check in on this man. Um, and nothing in this case sort of would um, change that case law. In the, in the hypothetical that Justice Kavanaugh gives, the officer goes to the front door and he knocks. And he doesn't receive an answer where all of the facts are suggestive of there is someone in trouble in the house. This is a very different circumstance. The information that just uh, that 
uh, Dean received was that the door was open. And recall, it's pled that the screen door was closed, so it's truly just the front physical door was open in a house. He did investigations around the house, saw nothing suspicious, and yet he entered the home for Fourth Amendment purposes, the cartilage is the home, um, and you know that violated clearly established law based on um, Linicum and all of this court's prior precedent that says that you need to corroborate information that you receive through a call. Um, a call itself is not enough to allow the um, police to enter the home. So I'll turn um, to the excessive force claim. Um, so at, we talked about a minute ago that um, Dean's body cam footage shows that Ms. Jefferson did not point a weapon of any kind at Dean or his partner. Um, Judge Englehart, the footage itself is not in the record. Presumably it will get introduced at summary judgment. Um, Dean, of course, had the opportunity and could have introduced the body cam and converted this to a motion for summary judgment, but that's not what happened in this case. This is uh, based on the allegations in the complaint. Um, and, you know, at, we're in the light most favorable, there was no gun. But even if this court disagrees and, and you know, it is, um, and the complaint is read that she, that there may have been a weapon, still the allegations are that she didn't point a weapon of any kind at Dean or his partner. And this, that makes this case indistinguishable from Baker, where um, at page 196 of this court's opinion in Baker, um, this court quoted the complaint in that case, which mirrors this one. The complaint in Baker said, even if the subject of the force had possession of or was holding a pistol, he did not point it at the direction of or towards the defendant. And that was enough to not just get past the motion to dismiss, but to get past summary judgment because factual disputes about whether there's a weapon and if so, what direction it's pointing are classic um, factual questions that a jury may have to resolve in this case. Um, I, if there are no further questions, I will um, sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. East, you've reserved five minutes. As to the search claim, the curtilage of the home is the same thing as the interior of the home. If you're searching for evidence to use against the homeowner, the courts have distinguished it. The Sixth Circuit in Taylor and this court in King versus Handorf said that a limited observation of the exterior of the home, if it's for a protective purpose under circumstances such as we have in this case, does not even rise to the level of Fourth Amendment search. In other cases that I cite, and she does not mention the First Circuit Belita case, where they said merely responding to a silent alarm call is the type of exigency that allows entry into a backyard, for example, in that case. And she admits there's no law on point on this subject that would clearly establish the law for that, so that every officer such as Officer Dean and his partner, that no no reasonable officer, not just those two, no reasonable officer could possibly think that what they did was allowed. There's no law that says that. There's no clearly established law. If the court rules on the clearly established law component only, then the underlying claim, I guess, survives as to the city if there's a question about the policy. But... I don't think that's necessary because I don't think he did anything that violates the Constitution or rises to the level of a search under these cases. She mentions the Linicon case. Well, in that case, officers were called about a child welfare issue, and they didn't arrive for two and a half hours. And in the record, when they talked to the people, they gained enough information to believe nothing was wrong. That's what the court held. It had nothing to do with responding to a potential burglary in the middle of the night and making split-second decisions like this case has. So is there a, is there a um, necessity to find some sort of corroboration? Uh, I'm sorry. I for think she cited the Lincom case to say that the allegations from the phone call would need to be corroborated. You're saying that you're distinguishing the case. My question to you is whether or not there was a requirement for him to, to corroborate the allegations before going into the curtilage of the home. Right, and there are a, a, a number of distinctions in Lincom. Number one, 
that was an entry into the home itself, and that was the issue there. But the law says that there's no difference between the home itself and in the... It doesn't say that for all purposes. If, if you're looking for evidence of a crime that the homeowner committed, then, yeah, if you find it in the backyard, that's going to be suppressed. If you find it in the house, that's going to be suppressed. But that's not what we have here. We have an officer performing a non-law enforcement purpose. That's a protective purpose. And these cases distinguish that. And in, in Linicom, um, in, in our case, he was still in the process, as Judge Ho recognized, of gathering those facts. He hadn't finished his one time around the house yet he was still in the process of gathering those facts and again glaringly opposing counsel does not say what he saw when he looked into that front door and nor is that in in the in the pleading and the the position that appellees have had on this weapon issue goes back and forth now appellee is arguing that the court is supposed to assume that Tatiana jefferson had no weapon because all they said was she didn't point a weapon well if that's their position, then under the Shultia standard or any pleading standard, all they have to do is plead she didn't have a weapon. If that's what she wants the court to infer, then there's no reason at all they couldn't have made that allegation, and, and they did not. Um, If she had a weapon, would it not be just as reasonable an inference that she heard someone prowling around outside of her house and whether or not it was a police officer, she may have thought that that was a, an intruder or a burglar or someone there to right. up to no good. And that's kind of the, the true dual nature of this case. That's sort of a tragedy. I'm not suggesting that she didn't have the right to go to her window and see what she was hearing. But Officer Dean was following his training orders and, and reasonable police procedure and looking around that house. And then he looks and he's suddenly confronted by this armed figure. And based upon what he saw, he, he, he felt that he was threatened by her use of that gun and, and the way she, and what she had and what she did with it again is not before us because plaintiffs... Why is not a summary judgment issue? I think it will be if that's necessary. I don't my, think it's my, necessary. The inference, if I have a question, is why Why is that an issue now? Why? I, I, I don't think it's necessary because it's a, it's a failure to meet their pleading burden in this case. I, I, they're asking the court to speculate when all they had to do was plead. If they want the court to believe she didn't have a weapon, they could have... Well, but isn't there pleading that she posed no danger and she was shot anyway? That's their argument in their briefing. They don't make, even make that in conclusory statement in there. That's the whole point of the complaint, isn't it? Of the excessive force claim. Well, they don't manage to say that. She's innocent person at home and she was shot right. for no good reason. That's There's no question that she had the right to be in that house. But what confronted Officer Dean in that split second is the classic tense, uncertain split second decisions that officers have to make. And if the plaintiff wanted the court to conclude that she did nothing. She, or she didn't have a weapon, or she did nothing that was at all threatening uh, that he could but possibly. The thrust of the pursue. complaint is she posed no threat, and, and you're not allowed to shoot. When well, that... I think that's the thrust of their argument and briefing. I, I don't know that they even say that in conclusory fashion. I know that's what they're suggesting. I know. I, I understand that they're they're not wanting to say what she did, and they avoided doing so, and they're wanting the court to fill in blanks, which I think is a, is a leap too far under our pleading standards. We have your argument. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you both. Uh, case is submitted. Well, now, uh, case 24 dash